This episode of Lawyers Tell All is brought to you by the Intake Academy. Are you ready to convert more callers to qualified cases, rapidly qualify good cases, and transform unqualified prospects to advocates for your firm, whether you're able to handle their case or not? Visit www.intakeacademy.com and discover how to cement relationships with more of your ideal clients. Get them to commit to you and send you more referrals than you ever thought possible. Welcome to the Lawyers Tell All podcast, where Chris Mullins, the preeminent sales and communications consultant in the legal industry, shows you how it looks through lawyers' eyes. Here, innovators in the trenches provide powerful insights that help you connect with new clients, handle the sometimes harsh realities of the legal profession, and embrace the mindsets needed to succeed. Be sure to visit our website at www.lawyerstellall.com. And while you're there, subscribe to us via your favorite network. Now, lean in, tune in, and let's take a deep dive. Hello, everyone. It's Chris Mullins with Lawyers Tell All, and I am here with attorney Hillary Walsh, and I'm going to let Hillary introduce herself. Hi, Chris. I'm Hillary. I am the owner of New Frontier Immigration Law. I'm a military spouse of 17 years to my Air Force husband and a mom of four kids, nine-year-old twins, a seven-year-old, and a just now five-year-old. I'm so happy to be here. Uh, Well, we're happy to have you. Thank you so much. So Some of the questions that you sent were talking a little bit, I think that one of the first ones is, how are you showing up in your life during alcohol abuse? Yeah, a big part of my journey right now in the past 18 months has been a decision to stop drinking alcohol, something that I think that the attorney sphere and definitely the the military um, culture Mm -hmm. both have a lot of, uh, have really, um, probably learn to appreciate and normalize alcohol abuse where it's okay to be hung over the next day. And really what that comes down to is abusing our bodies. And we're, we're so used to it, especially as we get older, where we have one or two drinks and we think, oh, it's just because I'm getting older. And really it's because it's the poison hitting us where, you know, our bodies are, are just not used to processing it. Mm-hmm. And I decided in May, 2021 to stop drinking alcohol for 90 days. Mm -hmm. And just basically reevaluate my relationship with alcohol. And it was so liberating to realize how much mental space I had been devoting to thinking about drinking Mm -hmm. and how much anxiety I had, how much anxiety the next day I would have in my body. So when the question is, how was I showing up? I I liken it to, to feeling a lot like two people where my day job, I was showing up um, as a confident, successful business person, a confident, decisive, powerful decision maker for my Mm -hmm. clients. And on the inside, I was like a shaking chihuahua because I had such bad anxiety, really stemming from all the chemicals in my body. And I think that people start to hear me talk about alcohol. And I suppose that they might think that she, she must have drank a lot. And I would drink about a bottle of wine. And I think that depending on who you talk to, that can be a lot or it can not be a lot. Mm -hmm. And at the end of the day, it's each individual's decision about how much they want, how many toxins they want to take into their body. And I just chose that for right now, that's just not going to be something I do. Yeah. What what happened? What what was the switch that kind of went off that made you say, I'm going to do the 90 days? Like what what happened? Yeah. The November beforehand, I had done a 21 day like reset essentially and felt great during it and had made the decision not to go back to drinking as frequently as I had. But over time that really eroded all over again. And I found myself drinking as much or even more often than I had before I had done the 21 day reset. Mm -hmm. So it was like breaking up with a a psycho ex-boyfriend, deciding I'm never going to call him again, and then moving back in with him. And that's Mm -hmm. kind of what my relationship was like with alcohol, where it felt like this was not like, this might be the thing that helps me de-stress the most was actually what was causing so much chaos in my life and just, just feeling terrible. So Mm -hmm. that was, I mean, I decided I was going to do a 90 day total body makeover Mm -hmm. and 
it, that started with internal, with what I was putting in my body and alcohol was the first thing to go. Okay. So you did a, a whole makeover. Yeah. I, in May, 2020, I had brown hair. Um, I, I had longer hair than I have now, but it was still short. I did a mommy makeover. I had my boobs done. I had my, a tummy tuck where I had all of this skin that was literally just hanging out mm -hmm. unattached to my body was other than like, you know, through tissue, I guess, mm -hmm. had all of that locked off. And, um, yeah, it's, it's been a really good, it's been a really good 18 months. Blondes have more fun. <laughs> Blondes At least the fun. sober blonde does. Yeah. So it must feel great, right? All the changes that you've made, the makeover and everything. Yeah. I think that anytime you make, you make lasting changes, usually it feels good, but there are definitely, you know, there are things that people say to you when you decide to start showing up differently that you mm -hmm. Like you can just never imagine the random things that people will say to you mm -hmm. and you just have to learn. Sometimes they're coming, they're trying their hardest to be kind. Um, but you know, you hear enough times from people, for example, that I can never pull off your, what you're wearing, or I could never pull off your hair. And mm -hmm. it's an interesting backhanded compliment, but it's just people's projections. When you start showing up and saying, I I not like everyone can do their thing. Mm -hmm. I just happen to really like these things. And so that's what I'm going to do. Yeah. And you start coloring a little bit outside the lines of what's socially acceptable, perhaps. And people can't help but say things about it. Right. They just so the, the, they the makeover has been fun, but it also yeah. has, you know, it's, you have to just learn that people are going to say what they're going to say. Another learning experience. Yes, whether you want it or not. <laughs> I mean, and here's the thing: um, people are gonna. People probably said lots of things about me. Um, I'm an outgoing person anyway, and then you add alcohol to that, and I am a very loud person. Mm -hmm. and so I'm sure people were saying things about me anyway. Um, probably not in a very nice, like probably in a negative way. Mm -hmm. um, so it's nice to now know that if I do say something out of turn, at least there's no other contributing factor other than I just need to get right. it together. Yeah, that makes perfect sense. So tell me a little bit about, you said a little while ago that um, attorneys have fear about the alcohol. What are, what are your thoughts around that? Well, I mean, I think that attorneys have normalized alcohol, many attorneys, mm -hmm. not every single attorneys, but like if we look at, you know, the number one, professions um, that have mental health problems, we also can't help but notice that attorneys abuse alcohol, it's very normalized, and they have mental health problems. So I, I, can't, I can't untangle the two things from each other just because of my own personal experience mm -hmm. with it. Lots of people drink alcohol and they don't have mental health issues. I just think by and large, when we have a, as a culture or as a profession where you can't go anywhere to any bar function and not have a happy hour. You can't network mm -hmm. as a professional without a happy hour. Mm -hmm. That tells me that on some level, alcohol use is normalized and yeah. the nasty, dirty side of alcohol use is it's not abuse because you just lost control this one time. It's because alcohol is made to disarm your brain yeah. and help you make bad decisions. Mm -hmm. So, you know, uh, there's a great book called This Naked Mind, and there's an even better book for women, um, you, you know, in my experience called um, Quit Like a Woman. And both of them are, are books written by women about their journey quitting alcohol, quitting the alcohol industry. And the thing that was so enlightening for me was learning about the marketing Mm -hmm. of alcohol and how the tobacco industry didn't market themselves very well. And here the tobacco industry lost in mm -hmm. the marketing game, but mm -hmm. the alcohol industry has won because you still see billboards where there are these beautiful young people holding a drink or cheering at a game or mm -hmm. whatever it is. They all yeah. look so happy and healthy and they don't look at all how I looked when I used that product. You know, when you see cigarette ads and you don't see the person 
laying in a bed where they can't breathe because their lungs are all black and charred because they smoked too many cigarettes in their life. With cigarettes, the cigarette industry lost because we blame tobacco because of the addiction, not the person. Mm -hmm. With alcohol use, we blame the person because they just can't keep it together. When in reality, there's a lot of correlations between addiction and alcohol use, just like there is with tobacco. So the marketing of the product also impacts the way that attorneys, I think any of us interface with alcohol use. And then our jobs are so dang stressful that, you know, non-attorneys, um, you, your livelihood, I think that very, very few professions are where if you make one simple human mistake, your entire livelihood can disappear, missing a, miscalendering a deadline. And you can lose, in theory, you can lose your bar license by missing a deadline because you put it on 2023 on your calendar and by accident instead of 2022. That's crazy. Mm -hmm. And the amount of stress you have you know, you're looking for a way to decompress and alcohol is a shortcut to that for a lot of people. Mm -hmm. what, what would you say to attorneys though? I mean, if you, if you could speak to a group of them and your focus was to help them with the mental health challenges, you know, with or without alcohol, even food is an addiction. What, what would you say to them? What kind of advice or support would you give them? Yeah, everyone is. Everyone has their own um, next right thing to do. Everyone has their, they know already. No one walks into a gym wondering, like, do I need to get in better shape? Like mm -hmm. once you realize that I want to live a different life, I don't want to keep feeling this way, then you have to evaluate, well, like, do I have a shopping addiction that needs to go because this is depleting mm -hmm. my resources too much or my mental bandwidth? Do I have, you know, my comfort eating? And that's why I always feel like crap because I'm eating crap. And then a lot of, there's a lot of, even from a religious perspective, people get wrapped around the guilt and shame of drinking alcohol. And at the end of the day, it's just an evaluation with your relationship. So I don't think anyone needs to quit anything forever. That's never the deciding point for me. It's like, yeah. it's amazing that we get married and we say we're going to get married forever. I know. <laughs> like, I mean, I hope I stay married forever. Um, but at the same time, like, I, I don't know how people every single day just make this commitment. And similarly, when mm -hmm. I decided to quit drinking alcohol, and even today, I don't think I'm ever going to drink again. But the point isn't alcohol is the bad thing. My relationship with alcohol was the bad thing. And I know that it's not serving me. So if you know, something's not serving you, it, why are you doing the same thing over and over again? What? And then that's where the tension lies. I'm doing the same thing over and over again, because I don't know what the other option is. And there is always a better option than abusing yourself. Mm -hmm. So I've always felt that once you let go of one addiction, you tend to, maybe not everybody, I think, but most people I've talked to replace it with another addiction. And so my, my question to you is, what, what have you replaced, you know, the addiction of alcohol with? And maybe yours is a bunch of positive things that you're doing. I don't know, maybe it's a, their new addictions too. I'm not really sure, but what, how do you answer that? A couple of things to touch on there. So anytime, The Power of Habit is a great book that kind of describes essentially what you're getting at, which is when we have a habit loop, we have the trigger, we have the thing we do, and we have the reward. It can be eating, the book talks about like eating cookies or sugar or something like that. Mm -hmm during that three o'clock slump right after lunch where you're a little bored and do you have a cup of coffee or do you have the cookies in the break room? And then you eat the cookies in the break room and you feel that boost. And the next thing you know, you're coming down and it's five o'clock and it's time to go home. You can be trying to break that habit loop as well. And you do usually have to replace a habit loop mm -hmm. with a different habit in order to reshape the way that, that we're wired. Um, I don't think that... I don't think that everyone who abuses alcohol is an addict. So mm -hmm. I think that's also, or that they have an addiction. It really can just be distilled down to a habit. Mm -hmm. You go home, for me, it was go home, start dinner, 
open a glass of, open a bottle of wine, have that first pour while I'm cooking dinner for my family. You feel the, the like cascade of relax relaxation mm-hmm. come over you. And by the time you get your kids to bed, you've already had a bottle of wine because there's like three and a half glasses in a bottle of wine. By the time mm-hmm. you cook dinner, have dinner, get dishes done, baths, everything else, you've had a bottle of wine. And that's just the beginning of your relaxation time. Now you want to continue this relaxation time. And all of this is just a habit. Um, I don't have any major habits that I've, I have not created a new habit loop. I, I, um, I don't actually cook anymore. I, we have a chef who cooks for us. So I go home and eat now. Mm-hmm. So maybe that's been a big part actually, now that I think about it, of like oh, no. <laughs> breaking the habit loop is just tossing that habit out altogether. And I realize that not everyone is, is going to walk out and go hire a chef in order right. to cook dinner. But even on nights when I cook dinner, it's just, it's simply not it's just not an option in my life. I give it zero mental space. I drink a ton of LaCroix. Um, I drink, I'm looking over here at the can of it. it, It's like, um, sparkling water. Oh, okay. Flavored sparkling water. Mm -hmm. Um, but even when I very first quit, I never had a craving at home to drink alcohol. It would be this, like the first time I went to, I'm a huge Phoenix Suns fan, the basketball team. And when we would go to a Suns game, I had always drank draft beer while I was at a Suns game. Always got a beer first thing when you got there, Mm -hmm. but they had alcohol free beer. And so I would just get a Budweiser zero and drink that. And you feel like you're still partaking it in this memory Mm -hmm. and you kind of ride that wave out. And so I don't know that you necessarily have to replace it with something else. But in moments like that, that you feel like you're wanting to participate Mm -hmm. and yet not drink alcohol. There are tons of ways to do that. Mm -hmm. It's really fascinating. I mean, if you really think about it, you could probably talk about it forever. You know, this, this whole topic and you just really everything that we've talked about so far that it touches on so many different things. People that probably listening to this right now, they probably have a list of things in the head. Well, what about um, addiction to go back to college or not even addiction, just, I'm going to replace it with being busy all the time or, you know, something different for everybody. And like you said earlier, shopping, you know, there's, there's something that, that we're all doing. I I know it happens to me pretty much on a regular basis and I'm always examining it. Um, why did you become an attorney? I don't know. I mean, there's so many, there's, I don't think there's one clear cut answer, but I don't have a family of attorneys or anything like that, that sometimes people do have. I had a very traumatic experience when I was a teenager where I, for the first time and really the only time, thankfully had to intersect with the um, court system as a teenager. And that helped push me on a path. I didn't know it at the time, Mm -hmm. but I really decided to become a lawyer when I was volunteering in Uganda. I met a woman who had been displaced because of um, the Lord's Resistance Army in Northern Uganda. And it was just a horrendous kind of like a guerrilla, like, I don't even know what you would call it these days. They probably have different acronyms for it than when I was studying political science a long time ago. Mm -hmm. But she had been displaced and her, her family, severely traumatized by the war that was going on that no one on the outside of the world was really talking about. And she shared with me that she wanted to become a judge in Uganda. Hmm. And I, I mean, she was in her easily well into her twenties and I was in my early twenties. And that moment of kind of knowing that that was probably not going to happen for her in my mind and observing that in her and knowing that the world was very available and open to me and kind of seeing the privilege of that. Mm. I had been toying with the idea of going to law school and I decided to go to law school then. And within a year I was in school. Wow, that's great. So there's your answer. <laughs> so yeah. You, you well, it's so many, them. it was like so many different bricks that make up that wall. Yeah. Um, that, that I guess a launch pad or whatever it's called. There are a lot of different really cool um, like God winks that along the way are like, this is the path you're supposed to be on. You're in the right place. Keep walking, keep walking. Mm -hmm. Um, you know, and that led me to law school. Yeah, that's wonderful. So 
for other attorneys with with the alcohol that want to maybe they're listening to this right now and they want to explore um you know having come, some kind of reset whatever it is they're kind of like thinking about it just by listening right now how what would you say to them to help them potentially go from just thinking about it from us talking to the next step yeah i have a 21 day um email um, kind of a source of encouragement for people. So it's a 21 day program. I don't sell it or anything like that. There's nothing attached to it. Mm -hmm. but I offer 21 days. If you make the decision that I want to quit drinking and reassess my relationship with alcohol for 21 days. And honestly, even if you drink during that 21 days, it, the drinking isn't the thing that you need to do or not do. It really is the relationship reevaluation. And just like with a, potentially toxic relationship, you don't have to move out and decide, is this relationship toxic or not? You can, you can make the decision while you're still in it. So you mm -hmm. can keep drinking during these times, but if you go to my website, hillarywalsh.com, two L's and Hillary, you can sign up for a 21 days guided encouragement, science-based, a lot of the stuff that I just, I want to share this with other people and it really normalized the conversation. I was talking to my lead attorney in my firm earlier today, and she was reporting in about how another one of our attorneys is handling the fact that she made she missed a deadline for someone. She thought that she made the deadline, but she missed a deadline for mm -hmm. someone. And we had to let the, you know, of course, the first step is to call the client and let the client know, and then try to remedy it with the remedy that is most appropriate for the client. And I wanted to see how is this attorney handling this? Mm -hmm. because she's an attorney for 16, 17 years. It's a big deal. And it's her first time because she's been in the government for all this time. It's her first time mm -hmm. to be on in the hot seat, essentially. Yeah. And what my lead attorney shared about the other attorney's experiences, she just beating herself up so hard. Yeah. And we are held to such a high standard. Mm -hmm. High achievers always are. And it's usually because that's how we found love from our parents or our teachers yeah, right. or whomever yeah. mm -hmm. in our lives. Mm -hmm. And then when we fail, it's almost like everyone is going to finally find out that you're a big screw up. Mm -hmm. And then we hide behind the cloak of numbing with alcohol or whatever it might be. And at the end of the day, it's just self-abuse. We're abusing ourselves in these sometimes microwaves that microwaves, not microwaves, yeah, right. <laughs> that over time erode our trust in ourselves. Because if I can't trust myself not to drink tonight, like when I was deciding to quit drinking, I would be like, I'm not drinking on school nights. You know, like my kids have school tomorrow. I'm not drinking tonight. So mm -hmm. Sunday through Thursday was a no drinking in the house. Mm -hmm. But then what happens if I win this huge victory at court yeah. on a Wednesday, mm -hmm. screw it. I'm going to drink like this. Mm -hmm. This is never going to happen again. This is a, this is an exception to the rule. I don't want to live by rules. I made that rule up myself. Mm -hmm. All that is, is eroding your self trust because you said yeah. you weren't going to do this. And we, we do that, whether it's, um, making a mistake at work saying something um, mm -hmm. out of integrity about a friend. And then you feel like such a jackass because you said something you shouldn't have said. And who am I? And you have to reevaluate that. And at the end of the day, it's just okay to make mistakes. It's okay to just be human. Mm -hmm. And wherever you are on that, and however you're beating yourself up, that's the part that you, like an alcohol reset can help you with that. Mm -hmm. isn't not numbing, but overall, like just an evaluation of your relationships that don't make you feel good mm -hmm. is really the starting point. Mm -hmm. Well, two things, and I have to say two things because I don't want to forget. Um, <laughs> and I don't want to look, right, look down here and keep writing everything. So two things. Um, one is the guided 21 days. How is it guided? And then the other question is, so let's just say for the attorneys that are, are afraid of making mistakes, like the examples that you gave, how, what would you help? How would you help them 
advice wise to resolve how they're handling it. Mm -hmm. I'll go in reverse order and answer. So the, the person who makes mistakes and beats themselves up, the easiest way to get out of that, you're such a screw up loop, or, you know, I feel really guilty that I've messed up somebody potentially messed up somebody's life. Like Mm -hmm. uh, most of us don't deal in a space where if we make a mistake, somebody dies, like, thank God, you know, in immigration law, that is, that can be the case though, because if your client gets deported to a place where in their home country, they could be killed. They were here to seek asylum and you didn't do a good job as an attorney, or you missed a deadline or, mm-hmm. you know, now they can't seek asylum because of your mistake, mm-hmm. they could get deported and be killed in their home country. So it is kind of intense on that front. Mm-hmm. And we bear great responsibility for that reason. But Anytime you make a mistake and find yourself really beating yourself up, you have to go back into your personal value system of why are you doing this to begin with? And my personal values are my number one value is future generations. And that drives all of my decisions because the gratification of helping someone now or the frustration of making a mistake now is often offset by the fact that I'm trying to help as many people as I can ethically and appropriately Mm -hmm. during my very short time on earth. So there is a cost of doing business. Mm -hmm. Not that I ever am over like wanting to minimize or anything, the mistakes I've made in my career. And there are too many. I wish that there weren't. Mm -hmm. But when I, when the, when the deed is done, And of course, when the deed is done, your first step is, you know, you call your ethics attorney and say, how do I stop doing this? You repair and and reassess and you make new checks and balances to your system. But when you're in that cycle, that's that loop of Mm -hmm. I've screwed this up and I feel really bad. You have to go back to why am I in this game to begin with? Mm -hmm. And once you can really refocus on that, I mean, maybe it's time for a reassessment on your values. If it's, um, mine are future generations, authenticity, and excellence. So those are all really important things to me. And if I'm acting out of alignment with any of those, I usually feel pretty ill. Mm-hmm. And that's because my body is just going to force me to recorrect. If you think that your um, core value is future generations or um, impact, and yet you find yourself terrified or refusing to like scale your business, for example, Mm -hmm. then you may not be the right person to scale the business. Mm -hmm. Maybe you should work for someone who you get to go and and be in that cheering section to be the one to keep it going because you just are so bothered or concerned by or whatever the, you know, emotion might be. Mm -hmm. Don't do things that are out of alignment with your values. And then the guided emails are very much based in science. They're very much like, this is kind of what you're probably going to be experiencing today. Here are tools for how to handle what you're feeling. Like I know my husband and he shared this in public, so I'm not airing any of his dirty laundry, (laughs) but about three weeks into his alcohol-free new life, he could not figure out why he stunk so bad. He had really bad body odor and Mm -hmm. he's a very clean guy. Two shower day, Air Force guy, Mm -hmm. stunk. His clothes were so stinky. And he realized after doing some Googling that it was the toxins leaving his body. It takes about three weeks for them to finally Hmm. unlock and start to release. And uh, who knew (laughs) if you didn't know that was coming. And it's the same for sugar Mm -hmm. and it's the same for dairy. I remember when I was, um, when I was first breastfeeding, I'm trying to remember, I think it was Lucy and she had, um, she was having an obvious reaction to something I was eating because I could tell because of her poop. Moms know that, mm-hmm. dads do know that the poop is the way to know, right? Yeah. If it doesn't look normal, it's not normal. Right. And Lucy had really bright green poop. And I talked to my lactation consultant. She said she has a uh, cow's protein intolerance. You have to stop eating anything that has dairy or mm-hmm. cow's protein in it. And it took three weeks for Lucy's poop to be right after I had stopped eating any dairy Mm -hmm. and the same is, so it it makes sense when you look at the body, just, it takes time for it to process. So it's stuff like there's no poop stories in, um, (laughs) in the email, uh, the guided email, 
but no, there's understand. lots of um, relatable, you know, this is how, and, and we have your back and remember why you started this to begin with. And it's okay if, if you, you know, need to start over, but just continue the 21 days, even if you drink, like mm-hmm. there's no wrong answer mm-hmm. in reassessing your relationship. Mm-hmm. No, I think that's great. And I think it would be a good idea to evaluate your why every month, like schedule it every single month and dig in your why. What is your why? Why are you here? Um, instead of just waiting for something to happen and then have to go into it. So any last words for everybody? I think that a lot of us are sleepwalking. Even when we're high achieving, we're still not really managing our time and our energy because we think that we have more time and all of these someday goals, like someday we're going to do this and someday we're going to do that. Next thing you know, like we're at the end of life. And, Mm. um, you know, my kid was talking last night about how she only has nine years. Today's election day. She's like, oh yeah, in nine years I get to vote. Mm. And that's nine summers I have left with my kids at home. Nine spring breaks. Mm. I have even fewer Christmases that are a big deal because soon they're going to have boyfriends or girlfriends. I want to go hang out with them at the holidays. And we think so much about someday as this far off place. And then we sleepwalk our way Mm -hmm. to a place that we're not even intentionally going. Mm -hmm. And that was another piece of wanting to get alcohol out of my life was I want to feel good. Now when I'm 36, 37, 38 years old, and I want to feel even better when I'm 75 or 80. Joe Biden is like 82, right? (laughs) <laughs> amazing. It, it's amazing. I mean, it's amazing. It, it's really amazing. My grandparents were dead and gone by then. They yeah. certainly weren't doing 11 press conferences in a day. Yeah. And I mean, not that Joe Biden is like my life goal. I'm just like, look what we can do. Yep. And I want to be able to be like, yeah, I can't believe, look at my great grandma. She's out like, you know, doing whatever. I was going to say hiking, but I don't even hike now. <laughs> Thank you so much, Chris. Yeah, absolutely. All right. Well, thank you so much. It's been a pleasure. If anybody wants to get in touch with you, how would they do that? Yeah, you can find me on Instagram. It's the underscore Hillary underscore show. So the Hillary show, or you can check out my website, which is forthcoming. Hopefully it's launched by the time that everybody gets hold of this. It's just hillarywalsh.com. Awesome. Wonderful. All right. Well, thank you. So long, everybody. We'll see you again real soon. Bye-bye. Thank you for tuning in to Lawyers Tell All, where Chris Mullins takes you on a journey with lawyers in the trenches who show you the realities of what it takes to succeed in this chaotic, crowded, ever-changing profession. Remember to visit our website at www.lawyerstellall.com and enjoy even more great episodes like this one. Again, while you're here, subscribe to us via your favorite network. We look forward to seeing you next time on Lawyers Tell All. Thank you.